Hi everyone, welcome to your first lecture for Intermediate Macroeconomics. I sincerely hope you're all staying safe and healthy. For today's lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on chapters 1 and 24 of the textbook. So for the first part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the history of macroeconomic thought, how macroeconomics became what it is today. In the second part, we're going to talk about the Great Recession, how the Great Recession unfolded, what were the different factors leading up to the Great Recession. And in the end, we're going to talk about uh, the math and economics that we will need for this course. So without further delay, let's begin. You have all taken a Principles of Macroeconomics class, so I'm sure you know what macroeconomics is. It is a branch of economics that studies the behavior of the economy as a whole. Therefore, it tries to answer questions like, why do some countries experience more economic growth than others? How, are, how have countries like South Korea and Singapore grown so much faster than other Asian countries? Why is Venezuela experiencing such high inflation? How did the rise and fall of housing prices in the United States lead to the Great Recession? What policies can be used and what policies have been used to reduce the severity of these recessions and the frequency of these recessions? The recent COVID-19 pandemic, it is a negative exogenous shock to the economy. What effects is this going to have on the economy in the next few years? The study of macroeconomics answers all these questions and many other questions related to the macroeconomy as a whole. Recall Adam Smith's book on the wealth of nations in the 1700s. Although economists, mathematicians, philosophers, and other researchers have studied economics for a while now, for centuries now, macroeconomics is a rather new field. In fact, modern macroeconomics actually began with the publication of Keynes's book in 1936. And in his book, what Keynes tried to do is he tried to explain what actually unfolded during the Great Depression of 1929. Keynes actually wanted to write a book that would largely revolutionize the field of economics. And it actually did. The Great Depression started in 1929, but none of the leading macroeconomic theories of the time could convincingly explain what actually went wrong during the Great Depression. Even without using fancy mathematical models and graphs, Keynes's book was better able to theorize the macroeconomics behind the Great Depression. Keynes basically provided the building blocks of modern macroeconomics. Okay, so a recession or a depression is characterized by falling output. Keynes argued in his book that aggregate demand or what he called as effective demand is what determines output in the short run. So, the Great Depression actually began with low aggregate demand, okay? So, since there was low aggregate demand, firms lost the incentive to produce. And since firms lost the incentive to produce, there was low output. And because there was low output, firms no longer needed to employ as many workers, which in turn increased unemployment. Increase in unemployment meant that there were low or no incomes. So since income was low, again, aggregate demand fell. And because aggregate demand fell, there was a fall in output. So basically, the Great Depression was a vicious cycle of falling aggregate demand and falling output. Because Keynes provided the framework that explained the economics of the Great Depression, his insights dominated macroeconomic theory for decades after its publication. In addition to his theories on aggregate demand and Great Depression, he made a number of important contributions. First, he introduced the link between consumption and income and how consumption is determined by the level of income. He also introduced the concept of a multiplier effect that explains how smaller shocks to, the, to aggregate demand amplifies into larger shifts in output in the economy. Second, he introduced the concept of liquidity preference, which explains how monetary policy can affect interest rates and aggregate demand. Third, and most importantly, he introduced the importance of expectations for macroeconomic variables like consumption. For example, if people expect incomes to increase in the future, level of consumption today is likely to increase, thus increasing output. As I mentioned before, Keynes never used any mathematical models in his book. So subsequently, following the publication of the general theory, many economists tried to represent his theories mathematically, like the ISLM model developed by John Hicks and Alvin Hansen. 
This line of macroeconomic thought that followed Keynes's theories was known as the neoclassical synthesis. And within this neoclassical synthesis, Franco Modigliani and Milton Friedman developed theories on individual consumption decisions over time. Their work made important contributions to how we look at consumption decisions today. For example, now we know that individuals are forward-looking and how income today is not only consumed today, but also saved and spread out over time. Again, within this neoclassical synthesis, economists like James Tobin developed a theory of investment which explained that investors will not only look at future profits, but also look at what those future profits are worth today. Another economist to build on Keynes' theories was Robert Solow. While many countries were destroyed by the Second World War, these were the same countries experiencing high rates of economic growth. Robert Solow developed a theory of determinants of growth, which was able to explain why these countries were experiencing such rapid growth. All these macroeconomic theories that we are discussing right now basically build on each other, trying to improve the model that came before them. By the mid-1970s, many countries began to experience stagflation, which was the combination of high inflation and high unemployment. And this was something economists at that time really couldn't understand because high prices are supposed to encourage firms to produce more and increase employment, not increase unemployment. And thus came in the theory of rational expectations by Robert Lucas and Thomas Sargent, who argued that the role of expectations in driving macroeconomic phenomena was greatly underestimated. So what really happened in the 1970s? A thing to note is the inflation in the 1970s was largely inflation in oil prices. Now, increase in oil prices, first of all, would increase cost of production. Second, it is a sign of bad days ahead. And this is where the role of expectation comes in. If firms are expecting bad days ahead, they're going to decrease production. And since they're decreasing production, they no longer need as many workers, and hence unemployment is increasing. Thus, increase in inflation led to increase in unemployment. And this is how expectations became one of the important things that economists started looking at. Another important contribution of the theory of rational expectations was known as the Lucas critique that said that we cannot assume macroeconomic relationships will continue to behave the same way if something in the economy changes. For example, changing the tax rate or changing the interest rates in an economy. And to combat this, Lucas suggested that macroeconomic models should be based on microeconomic foundations, and thus real business cycle models were developed. Within these real business cycle models, consumers made decisions to maximize lifetime utility and firms made decisions to maximize profits. Many economists questioned the, this complete move away from macroeconomic insights. And thus, the new Keynesian models were developed in response to the real business cycle models. These models incorporated nominal rigidities such as menu costs and described how decisions that do not matter at the individual level, like increase in prices, lead to large aggregate effects. These models also allowed for a role of fiscal and monetary policy to stabilize the economy in the short run. And more advanced versions of these models also incorporated financial frictions within the new Keynesian models. There are many economists who subsequently tried to incorporate different factors into all these models. We will discuss more of that in later chapters, but now move on to the second part of our lecture and we'll discuss about the recent financial crisis known as the Great Recession. This graph shows the real GDP growth rates of five advanced countries or regions between 2000 and 2016 and they all exhibit a similar pattern. From 2000 to 2007, these countries experienced sustained economic growth. Short-run ups and downs are usually normal, but beginning in 2007, growth rates plunged rapidly and eventually became negative, and this continued till at least 2010. And this was the Great Recession. Now look at the second graph. This graph shows the real GDP growth rates of five emerging countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. These are known as the BRICS nations. 
So these countries also exhibit a similar pattern. From 2000 to 2007, these countries experienced increased economic growth. But beginning in 2007, growth rates again plunged like the advanced, con advanced countries and eventually became negative. And this also continued till 2010. So how did the Great Recession actually occur? What happened in the preceding years? What led to this crisis? From 2000 to 2007, most countries, advanced and emerging countries alike, experienced large sustained economic expansion. However, this sustained large economic expansion came to an end in 2007, as we saw in the last two graphs, when there was a major decline in housing prices in advanced economies. Many believe that the Federal Reserve just needed to lower the interest rates to stimulate aggregate demand in the economy, as would have been required in the Great Depression as well. Others thought that the interest rate cuts would be insufficient to stimulate aggregate demand and we should be expecting a short recession. But with the exception of a few economists, no one really predicted the recession to be such a severe one. Sustained expansion turned into a recession. Housing prices continued to fall and a financial crisis began, began to emerge. But how did a housing crisis become a financial crisis? Banks realized that many of these mortgages given out during the expansion were of poor quality. That is, many of the receivers of these housing loans are unable to pay for them. And to make things worse, banks had packaged these poor quality mortgages into securities and sold those securities to other banks and investors. Given the weak state of the economy and the poor quality securities sold, banks became unwilling to lend to each other, fearing that other banks would not be able to pay back the loans. As a result, banks had piled up huge debt without any sign of getting any finance. The entire situation was like a house of cards. When one bank failed, others followed suit. In September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy, followed by many other banks. Following the bankruptcy of these banks, stock prices began to collapse as well. Houses and stocks are part of a person's wealth. As housing prices and stock prices kept on falling, individuals began cutting consumption in response to a fall in wealth. Given the uncertainty, firms also began cutting down on investment. Under these circumstances, aggregate demand can be increased by cutting interest rates, decreasing taxes, and increasing government spending. The Fed and the government did all of that. The Fed even lowered interest rates to zero, but nothing worked. Aggregate demand fell, and so did output. Things have gradually improved since the crisis began, especially after 2010, but there were real human costs associated with the recession. There was a big increase in the unemployment rate between 2007 and 2010. If you look at the graph, you can see how the ratio of job seekers to job openings increased sharply between 2008 and 2010. Now recall different measures to determine the health of an economy. You have your GDP and then you have your GDP per capita. In addition, economists also look at the output growth, unemployment rate and the inflation rate. But every measure has its own shortcomings. So when we're talking about GDP, you cannot really compare between the health of two economies using their GDPs. Why? Because one country might be so much larger in size and population than another country, and hence might have a higher GDP. When it comes to GDP per capita, it does not take into account inequality. So a country might have a high GDP per capita if some people are really rich and other people are not that rich, like here in the USA. If you talk about output growth, that also does not take into account inequality or basic rights of the people of a country. Then comes unemployment rate. Unemployment rate includes people actively looking for a job and excludes many other discouraged workers, homeless people who are still unemployed. Thus, it underestimates the true extent of unemployment. And when we're talking about the inflation rate, it fails to account for product quality. Prices may be higher because of higher quality products and individual buying habits. Just because the inflation rate is a little higher does not mean the economy is in a poorer state or a bad state.
we have reached the last part of this lecture, which is math and economics review. An economic equilibrium is a state in which two economic forces are in balance. The most common example is of the equilibrium between supply and demand in a market. Recall that an equilibrium is defined by two variables. In the demand supply model, those two variables are price and quantity. In the labor market, they are wage and the number of people employed in an economy. Several times in this course, we will be dealing with the concept of a steady state. This is applicable in the case of dynamic economic systems, systems that are changing over time. A steady state occurs when detrended variables are constant. Detrending means removing trend from a variable, that is, removing the increasing or decreasing quality from a variable. Now think about the economic variable xt. Here xt is a function of its past value, which is xt minus 1. Then the steady state for this economic variable, or for this situation, is at a point where xt equals its past value xt minus 1 is equals x. Then our equation becomes x equals a plus bx. And if we solve this equation, which is x equals a plus bx, we can solve for x. Solving this equation for x gives us this value, and this is our steady state. In this course, we will be talking a lot about endogenous and exogenous variables. Endogenous variables are variables that are determined within the model. In the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, price and quantity are determined within the model. That is, we can solve for them in the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. So they are endogenous to that model. On the other hand, exogenous variables are determined outside the model. For example, income affects aggregate demand but income is determined outside the model. That is, we cannot calculate income within that aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And hence, income is exogenous to the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. A portion of this course will involve solving for um, the equilibrium of two, any two linear equations. The best method for solving these systems is to substitute one of these variables in the other equation and find out the equilibrium values of x and y. My lecture notes also provide a link where you can practice these linear equations if you, don't, if you need to brush them up. During this course, we will also occasionally need to use algebra to manipulate exponents. I've provided you with some of these formulas. We will also be dealing with functions in this course and how an input x maps into an output value of fx or function of x. We also need to understand the relationship between x and fx, sometimes using differentiation and partial derivation. I've provided a link in my lecture notes where you can practice how to work out a partial derivative. We can also have functions of multiple variables which transform multiple input values like x and y into a single output value, which is fxy. An example of this would be fxy equals x to the power a times y to the power minus b. Now we need to understand the relationship between x and fxy and y and fxy. So as x grows larger, fxy also grows larger, so it has a positive relationship. However, here, if y is increasing, then fxy gets smaller and smaller. So the relationship between y and fxy is going to be negative. Now, now let's solve a simple question. Suppose that supply is given as QS equals 100 plus 4P and demand is given by QD equals 400 minus 2P. Now what you need to do is you need to find out the market equilibrium. The, finding out the market equilibrium is pretty simple. All you need to do is do QS equals QD and then you solve for 
P and then you find out the corresponding quantity that is associated with that level of price. Now this next question is about finding the steady state value for a process. Okay, so your equation is yt to the power a equals c times yt minus 1 to the power b. Now remember how we calculate steady state of an equation. All you have to do is you have to do yt equals yt minus 1 equals y and then you can solve for y and find out the steady state. Now suppose we have the following function, gxy equals x square plus 1 over y square. Now we need to find out the relationship between x and g and y and g. Okay, So as you can see from the equation, x and g have a positive relationship. If x increases, gxy also increases. But if we increase y square, okay, increasing y square will decrease g. So G and Y have a negative relationship. Okay, so that is the end of my lecture. Please refer to my lecture notes on Canvas for this material. And always feel free to email me about questions or stop by on Zoom during office hours. Bye.